I invite you to close your eyes, to put your feet on the ground as best as you can. I invite you to take a deep breath in and release. Take another deep breath in and release. I invite you in your imagination to picture a grounding cord going from the base of your spine down through your legs, down through the earth, all the way to the center of the earth. And I invite you to take any energy in your space right now that is not yours and send it right down that grounding cord to the center of the earth where it will be transmuted and sent back up in a form that is most useful to you. I invite you to picture a bright, big, golden sun over your head. And let the rays of that sun wash over you and flush out any energy that's not yours through your body and down your grounding cord. And now I invite us to take another deep breath in and release. Let's imagine for a moment that we are the clear blue sky. In that clear blue sky, we notice there are clouds. Those clouds are our thoughts. I invite you to watch the clouds. Just watch them go by. Whatever thoughts that you are thinking right now, I invite you to simply let them be, to notice them, to recognize them, to welcome them, and then let them go. The goal of our meditation today is not to be free of any thoughts, but to be free from our thoughts. Sometimes our thoughts run the show. Today, we are simply going to observe them. We will welcome them. We will notice them and then wish them on their way. This includes any thoughts that we might consider helpful thoughts as well. 
if helpful thoughts do come up, perhaps we write them down on a piece of paper. Perhaps we send ourselves a voice message or a text so that we don't forget their message. But even those helpful thoughts, we welcome them and we let them go. And as we are looking at the passing clouds of our thoughts, some of those thoughts, some of those clouds may be pretty gray. Some of them may be fluffy white. But what we do now using our imagination as we lift our consciousness up through the clouds to that part of the blue sky where we are above the clouds. From this vantage point, we look down and we can see that the clouds are down there, but they don't touch us. We are above them. And from this place of just observing, we feel the peace of being the clear blue sky. And now we take a few moments to bask in the peace of being the clear blue sky.
now from the place of being above the clouds, we descend back down through the clouds. Gently landing on the ground back to where we are, wherever we're seated today. And we begin to move our shoulders, our neck, wiggle our toes, move our fingers, feel ourselves completely present in this moment. Remembering that whenever our thoughts get the best of us, we can go back to being the clear blue sky, observing them, rather than letting them run our lives. We are grateful. We are blessed. Namaste. Hello, Unity of Madison. How's everybody doing today? I hope this finds you all doing well. I might look a little bit different today, but uh, it's because you're watching me on video, obviously. Mindy and I have decided to take a little bit of rest and relaxation. So here I am coming to you from video today. Technology has just allowed us to expand in these new and different ways, right? These new and different ways that we probably didn't expect. But in this instance, it's turned out to be a good thing because I can still see you even when I'm not physically there. So anyway. So today we're going to delve into uh, week three of our book study already. And, you know, I was sitting there thinking to myself when I was getting ready for this talk, I'm like, you know, time really flies when you're having fun. And I really, I really legitimately mean that because I'll admit that I'm really enjoying this book. You know, to me, it's very informative. And I love the fact that he shares a lot of his own personal experiences because that's what always relates well with me is when I hear these experiences that other people have gone through and these other experiences that people use to really launch and assist with their growth because it tells me I'm like, you know, if that person did it, so can I. So that's one of the things I really enjoyed about this book. And I hope that you're all feeling the same way and just all really enjoying this book as much as I am. So I wanted to delve right in because this is some really good stuff. Now, Chapter six really impressed me because, you know, I think it's something that so much, many of us just really struggle with as we navigate through life. And I know that I definitely have, and I'm sure many of you could probably, you know, join in with me on this one or relate with me on this one. Now, he starts off with a quote by author Cheryl Strayed, and I hate to curse in church, but the quote does have a couple of curse words. So if you don't like curse words, you know, you might want to just kind of plug your ears up for a minute, or if there are any kids in the room, you might just want to kind of plug their ears for a minute. But Cheryl Strait says, no is golden. No is the kind of power the good witch wields. It's the way whole, healthy, emotionally evolved people manage to have relationships with jackasses while limiting the amount of jackass in their lives. I used to tell my parents it was okay for me to say that because it was in the Bible. That didn't go over very well, so don't try it. But anyway, but that's really kind of a powerful quote, isn't it? I mean, we don't want to call anybody names here, but the art of saying no is a very empowering thing. It's one of those things that when you do it and you learn to not feel guilty about it, that you begin to feel about 10 feet tall. Heck, you might even feel 10 feet tall when you do it, even if you do feel guilty about it. But for me, I had this friend, an example of my, my own. I had this friend several years ago, and he was a nice guy, but he would so often just really zap the energy out of me. Now, I didn't really think about it much at the time, but the friendship was very one-sided. It was always about him and whatever he wanted and whatever he needed out of that friendship. 
And I remember at one point I decided to take a three-day staycation. You know, I had some, some time saved up at work. So I was like, you know, I'm going to take three days. I was single at the time and I planned on just spending it, just kind of recharging my batteries. I was going to read, I was going to relax and probably even hit some museums on my own. But he worked these really odd hours. So I remember my first day off, he calls me and he tells me his truck was in the shop and asked me if I'd mind just running him on a couple of errands, you know, quick, easy things. Those errands turned into two full days of just running him around all over town. And I didn't want to do it, but I also didn't want to say no to him. You know, while I didn't mind helping him with a few errands, I ended up spending almost my entire vacation just running him around. And it was, you know, that vacation didn't turn out to be quite like I'd envisioned it to be, all because the thought of saying no made me feel guilty. Or it even made me perhaps feel like I just wasn't being a good friend. But you know what? It came about later, you know, I had this revelation and this epiphany later, but I was allowed to say no at the time, and so were you. We, each and every one of us, is allowed to say no without excuse, without explanation, period. You know, obviously there are times we've got to, comp you know, we need to compromise with our spouses or our partners or our friends. You know, we sometimes need, we sometimes have to do things that we don't necessarily want to do, but that's a whole other subject. So please don't go home and tell your spouse or your partner or your family that, well, Reverend Evan said that I could say no all the time, so I'm saying no. That's, that's, on, that's you. That's on your own. But that's just a completely separate thing. Now, our author, Mr. De La Rosa, invites us to think about a moment where we said yes to somebody. And this was a time where we said yes, although every sensation in our body was screaming the word no. You know, we've all got those instances. And that's exactly what I had with my friend during that time. You know, I said yes, but my head and my body were screaming, heck no. And so many times after that, especially when I, when I would sit there, when I got back to work that next Monday and I was feeling drained, I wish I had just simply said no. Now, to be fair, you know, there are times when our bodies may be screaming no, yet we also know that deep down, whatever we're screaming no to is good for us. You know, for instance, my body will often so many times say no to cardiovascular training, yet I know it's good for me, so I learn how to work with and how to move through that no in that instance. Now, our author also mentions prayer and meditation, you know, things like that. You know, we may indeed feel some resistance to those things, but we also know that they're good for us. He refers to these things as the kind of no we do well to get curious about. Or maybe learn how to dance gently past so we can move closer to our truest desires. He then goes on to what he refers to as the compassionate no. Now the compassionate no is, you know, this is saying no to an event because we've had a really day at work. You know, maybe somebody says, hey, you know, you want to go for happy hour after work or you want to go do this or that after work. And we're just flat out tired. Or, you know, we say no to visiting an abusive family member. Those types of things that really make us feel depleted or wanting to turn tail and run away is just as fast as we can. He goes back to the body here and he asks us to think about a situation like one of those that I just mentioned and to really go in and think about the sensations that you felt in your body during that time. You know, like back that time with my friend, I just felt this sense of just kind of a, not really a dread, but something kind of like that come over me. It was just like this sense of tiredness when he asked me to help him run those errands. You know, it, it made me think back to, I remember when my mother used to wake me up on Sunday mornings telling me it was time to get up and go to church. You know, I didn't like to go to church when I was a child. I was often bullied by the kids there and I just didn't like to go. And then since the sensation in my body screamed no at that time. And that was also looking back, the sensation that I felt in my body when my friend asked me to run those errands. You know, not that he was going to bully me or anything like that, but I had the similar sensation of just not wanting, of wanting to say no because I didn't want to spend my time off in that manner. You know, and later on, I was able to eventually realize why it was that I felt that way. I knew, even on a subconscious level, that it wasn't the first time he'd ever taken in the friendship without giving back. And I knew that it wasn't going to be the last time. Me saying yes when I wanted to say no really made me feel powerless and weak. 
And I want to read something out of a, our booklet on that. It's on page 81 in case you want to go back and reread it. But our author, our author tells us, in countless sessions, clients have told me about painfully tangled interpersonal webs they find themselves in. I typically ask, why didn't you say no? Only to have the response come back, well, I would have felt guilty. My follow-up question, which is worse? The situation you're in now or the guilt you would have felt? Which one is more intense and which one lasts longer? So for me, back with my friend, it really would have been better to feel guilty over saying no because those feelings of powerlessness and weakness wouldn't have even been there for me in the first place. I would have also been able to avoid the resentment that I felt for him, you know, in the future and after that instance. But I think sometimes we get so caught up in not wanting to let somebody down that we forget about ourselves and how instead we let ourselves down. But when we learn to check in with our bodies and even our minds and learn to get familiar with the sensations there, and to become curious about why it is that we're even wanting to say no in the first place, we can go back to what I talked about last week, that thing called self-love. And in that self-love, we can learn to set those healthy boundaries for ourselves. The same as we would any other person or any other being, you know, our pets, whatever it is that we love. But now I wanna switch gears here a bit because remember earlier when I mentioned saying no to meditation? Yeah, you know who I'm talking about. But I want to talk about that a little bit because chapter one, it actually kind of gave me a little bit of a chuckle because the title of it is this. About that meditation practice you're kind of, sort of, sometimes, maybe doing. Now, I fall into that category sometimes. I'm going to admit it. I'll be like, meditate? What? Who in the heck has the time to meditate? And then before I know it, I've just fallen completely out of the habit, you know, and I'll watch another episode of Star Trek or Ghost Adventures and be like, you know, I really wish I had time to meditate. I don't know why I don't have time. But Mr. De La Rosa makes me laugh because he talks about how one time he liked this girl. And she often liked to talk about meditation and he wanted to be able to impress her because he's thinking, you know, there may be a time where she asked me if I know anything about meditation and I want to be able to tell her yes. So he decides to take a couple of minutes one day and just sits down and does, you know, just kind of shuts his eyes and does, you know, some little whatever he considered meditation at the time. And he felt satisfied after that because sure enough, she asked him one day if he knows anything about meditation and he was able to tell her, well, yeah, sure. I've done it before. I know all about it. But we know that meditation is really more than that, isn't it? It's more than just sitting down for a couple minutes to be able to impress somebody or to tell the world that we meditate. It's also one of those things that we'll often find we will never know all there is to know about it because it always moves us and stretches us, right? It provides new insights and it helps us to expand our consciousness and to really be able to see things in new ways. One thing that I personally have learned about meditation is to never go in expecting a specific outcome or go into it with any preconceived notion. Because when we get to that point, we'll begin to close ourselves off to all that meditation could be. We begin also to miss out on the true practice of meditation and where it could take us when we do this. We, of course, actually have to practice meditation though, right? And then we have to enter into it with an openness and a willingness to allow it to begin to work its magic in our and I remember when I first started learning about meditation, you know, I would refuse to do it at first because I was told, or so I thought, that I had to completely erase all thoughts out of my mind. I thought that I had to sit there with absolutely no thoughts. And a lot of people I've talked to have actually felt the same way. They thought you just erase all thoughts out of your mind. But I try it, and you can just imagine how that went, probably how it would have went for you if you had done the same thing or if you did try the same thing. But then I've learned to sit there or then someone told me, they're like, well, you know, you don't have to sit there with an empty mind. Just focus on your breath instead. All right, that, you know, that sounded easy enough. So I'd sit there and I'd focus on my breath or I'd count my breath. And then before I know it, I'd kind of snap out of it and realize that I had forgotten my breath long ago because I was too busy thinking about, you know, my grocery list or what I was going to have for dinner or whatever. So I quit doing meditation. It just seemed to be too difficult and likely not something I could master. But the thing that I was missing out on 
was that I was going in with this preconceived notion over what I thought it was supposed to be. And it was causing me to miss out on the true practice itself. You know, I was so busy being focused on what I thought it was supposed to be that I wasn't allowing it to just happen and to just unfold. You know, sure, a lot of those things, you know, being able to focus on the breath and even be able to sit there with a clear head. You know, those things may come at some point, at least for small snippets of time in your meditation. But it takes time, right? And during that time, we can still practice and receive the beautiful gift of just being able to sit in this wonderful practice, however it unfolds for you. And we can all learn to do this. All of us, there's nobody there that can't actually meditate. Nobody out there that can't meditate. But instead of fighting those thoughts that come during our meditation, why not get curious about them? Why not that specific thought, why not just let that specific thought enter into your mind in whatever moment it wants to enter? You know, sure, it may be a random thought, but it may be more. You know, the important thing is that you allow it to come and you become open and curious. Not even just curious about thoughts that may come and go, but even curious about the practice of meditation itself. You know, part of my initial issues with meditation were also that I wasn't experiencing what I expected to, what I thought I was supposed to experience. I often went into it expecting some, you know, life-altering revelation to occur during my meditation. But I decided to maybe instead go in and ask questions and to become curious about what came. And after a while, I began to learn that what I was thinking and experiencing wasn't like, you know, some Hollywood version. And eventually that life-altering aha moments wasn't even the point of meditation. I let those things go. And I began to realize that meditation, at least for me, was much more than that. And I began to realize, you know, after a while that I could work through decisions more clearly those kinds of things, you know, and your experience may not be, may or may not be the same during your own meditation. But again, just remember to enter into the practice with an openness and a willingness to allow, just to allow it to unfold. And remember the four skills that we've been discussing in the book, you know, pausing, unblending, becoming curious, and shifting that inner dialogue. I think especially those first three could be very beneficial here. You know, maybe, maybe we don't feel like we're, we're Pema Shadron here. You know, maybe we hear her speak about meditation and think, you know, oh my gosh, my experience isn't at all like hers. Of course it won't be because we're not Miss Shadron. Her experiences are hers and hers alone. So we can take a moment to pause and to release those preconceived notions about what meditation should or shouldn't be. We can also practice the skill of unblending here. You know, stepping back and allowing ourselves to see the whole picture. Can the effects of meditation be felt right away? You know, can the effects of meditation be felt right away during the midst of a practice? However, or certainly. However, sometimes it requires us to be able to take that step back. To take a moment and to just look at the entire picture. You know, see moments here where opportunity presented itself. Another moment where we had that epiphany where, you know, this person entered our life. Those types of things that happen when we're not sitting in the middle of this practice of meditation. It's likely going to be a culmination of moments. But we can sometimes be standing too close to the picture to be able to step back and see the whole thing. And curiosity. You know, I invite you to get curious. Get curious about some of those thoughts that enter your mind during your practice, even after. Even with some of the frustrations that you may feel around meditation. Maybe you're thinking you're no good at it or can't do it. But it's likely that those thoughts are just simply tied to fears. Tied to fears of maybe not being good enough or able enough. Whatever the case may be. Become curious. Allow yourself to become curious. And to ask those deeper questions. You know, what, what is it that I'm feeling? And why is it that I'm feeling that way? Or why would I think this certain thought during meditation? Now I want to read something else. And this is from page 93 of our book. It's the very last chapter on page, or, uh, on page 93. He says, I, your meditation teacher, officially give you permission to not meditate. 
to just let your thoughts and emotions run free like the wild horses that they are and to let whatever's happening in your environment just to go on. Give up surrendering the self-improvement project. You're not a fixer-upper and you're not. This is the time to just really allow yourself to be curious. And even just as we go through this study on these four skills, just learning to pause, to unblend, to get curious, and to start that shift, just to start to shift that inner dialogue. This is those times when we can really start to read about this and learn what these four skills are and how we can implement them into our lives. So anyhow, miss you all. I'm looking forward to seeing you all again. I'm hoping, very hopeful, that we can reopen on Easter Sunday. So there'll be more um, coming on that and we'll continue to watch cases of COVID and trends and you know, we know a lot of good things are happening. The vaccination is, you know, more people are becoming vaccinated. So we'll just kind of watch that and see what happens. And hopefully we can all be back in person uh, by the summer. Uh, again, we'll just kind of see how that goes. But anyhow, you all have a wonderful Sunday and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.